evening and welcome to Tinkering with Ed Kellar. For the last two episodes, I have taken apart and started to rebuild a Tektronix 576 curve tracer. If you haven't seen those, please check them out first. When I left off in part 2, I had the collector supply pretty much done, as well as the low voltage supply section. Let's see how far we get today. Now for the rest of the wiring loom. I kept some of the selection switches connected, the step generator options for one. It selects the number of steps as well as the current limit for the base voltage ranges. As usual, I double check the correct alignment of the discs with one or two key positions with the schematics. untangling the larger part of the wiring loom next. The wired components up front are part of the step generator amplifier supply, including two more electrolytics. This provides smoothing for the generated signal. But why two of them? One for each polarity. There's a diode in parallel with each, so the polarity switch, implemented with relay K102, will make one of them active and the other one is shorted out with the diode. I checked those and they are working fine. The huge power resistors, two doubled up 20 ohms, are part of the current setting network on the step generator output. The little heatsink in the core of the unit is actually the output stage of the step generator amplifier. It deserves new thermal paste. And in it goes. This is one of the most inaccessible parts, so it would be bad if I had to unearth it again. Double checking the soldered wiring. And the mounting plate for the attenuator switches goes in next so that the plate for the step generator has all its supports. And of course, the step generator itself. And out again, because I missed the screws that hold the little mounting brackets for the attenuators. Next, the display amplifier. It does come with some interesting PCB relays, literally in this case, 
The actuated contact is part of the relay assembly, but the static contacts are just etched into the PCB. It takes the XY input signals and turns it into useful deflection voltages for the CRT. The collector sensing resistors go in next. Indeed, as I suspected, these are the current shunts for the collector current. Depending on the range, more and more of these are switched in series. These over here. Indeed, the lowest value is listed as 0.025 ohms. Better make sure my solder joints are up to it. Located right next to the display amplifier, separated with the mounting plate, is the display switching board. It has the zero adjustment controls, as well as the display invert option. The relays on it can switch the horizontal or vertical signals directly to the test fixture provided signals, overriding the internally created ones. And now, adding the attenuators. I choose this way because I thought it might be easier to attach the front panel when all the switches are already in place again. Note that I keep the mounting screws loose until I can tighten down the front panel mounting screws first to avoid any stress on the components or switches. And that just so fits under my camera. The little clamps for the wire loom disintegrated. Very brittle. I made myself a little open scat model to replace them. Adding the front panel, now it starts to look the part again. Sorry for the slightly less than optimal camera angle here, I had to improvise a bit to even fit it in the first place. The multi-turn potentiometer for the step offset voltage is quite annoying. There is no key for it, so one has to tighten it up and keep it upright at the same time. A typical three-paw operation. For the test fixture connectors, all four of them, all but one nut are easy to reach and fit. But that one required some creative thinking. I had to resort to duct tape wrapped around a pair of pliers to hold the nut just enough for the first threads to catch. You can imagine the various tries and bleeps until that moment.
the variable collector supply control, the huge variac is next. Note, it just ever so slightly does not fit through the assembled case. And after the power switch and some miscellaneous hardware, the readout board adapter wiring. There is a camera power outlet on the front that provides 15 volt DC for a camera to take pictures. It originally had a weird 3-pin connector, but that has been replaced with a 3.5mm headphone jack on my unit. I don't really like those for power, so I replace it with a normal barrel jack instead. And now, adding the high voltage supply for the CRT. It features yet another chassis mounted capacitor. For this one, I'm using the cut and cover method. It showed quite some leakage on the tester too. Wiring up the mode and polarity switches again was perhaps the most difficult section of this build. Those are very tightly spaced and have a ton of wires. I almost got one of the contacts wrong too. Good thing to double check. The illumination potentiometer is also a bit hard to get to. And for some reason I put the yellow wire on the wrong pin here. Finally getting a grip on things again, mounting the handle. And finally, power on time. Still without the CRT for the first try, I bring up the voltage slowly and see if the DC rails show normal values. When shorted, there would be next to zero voltage. So far, all good. And here's where there might have been smoke. Remember those huge power resistors in the DC supply section? I expected them to get a bit warm under load, I mean, why else would they be this big? But even in the current, no load setting, they got extremely, as in burn your fingers hot after only a few seconds of operation. Yikes! 
So, a deeper look is needed. Turns out that these are the limiting resistors for the 50 volt supply of the step generator output amplifier. And they dropped over 8 volts when turning on, giving a current of over 2.5 amps. That seems way too much, even for a very power hungry and misadjusted amplifier. I double and triple checked every connection and even followed the signal. Step generator output is fine when it enters the amplifier, but is lost halfway through the final stage. I had a feeling that something in the final output transistors was wrong. A broken power transistor maybe? But since that heatsink is stuck way, way down in the guts, I ruled out other options first. Well, I tried disconnecting the final stage, that made the resistors run cool of course, but still, no signal. Turns out that the output amp uses a feedback loop that takes the input from after the final stage, so without that, it might go into some limiting mode. It was with quite a few beeps again that I finally unearthed the heatsink to check up on the transistors with my universal tester. And they all measured ok. But… It turns out that I accidentally flipped over Q172 and Q176, the smaller ones in the center. Ha! Ah! The heatsink is a bit too symmetrical, so I put them in upside down during assembly. NPN and PNP surely are not interchangeable. The collector supply finally goes back in. Connecting up all the knobs with the front takes a bit of time with all the insulation extensions. The 3.75 microfarad capacitor on the input side of the collector supply, the slightly leaky oil field one, will be replaced. For testing, I mount the 3.7 microfarad one I got with some gaffer tape. I want to cut and replace the oil one, but that seems like a full day job in itself. Getting the CRT cover ready again. The trace rotation coil snaps right in place and the Graticule illumination board screws on again. I straightened out the mounting bracket, but I couldn't find these tiny long screws, so I had to reuse the stripped out version with the cut slots from before. And finally, time to put in the CRT again. And the display board.
power on. Hmm, the display readout brightness works, but the graticule seems to be stuck. Remember that yellow wire? Yes, I fixed that after this check. Oh, and turning on the brightness shows a green blur on the left edge, so I seem to have a signal, it's just way off screen. Now, the calibration guide relies heavily on a calibration fixture. Now, where would I find one of those? Oh, right, the person I got the tracer from borrowed me theirs. So this one isn't going to get the full treatment, but I shall at least clean out the cobwebs and check for any stray resistors or similar before I plug it in. I even managed to keep the calibration void seal intact. Just remove the panel with the handle and it's fine. Checking all the voltages. Only the negative 75 volt rail can be adjusted, the others have to follow or be within spec on their own. Now the calibration procedure is quite lengthy and boring, so I spare you hours of adjusting potentiometer footage, but here are two highlights. First, I couldn't adjust the vertical one's balance and one's gain. No matter how much I tweaked the potentiometer, it wouldn't change anything. Turns out that these potentiometers are indeed broken. I found the required values in my random potentiometer drawer. The form factor is a bit different though. A bit of in-situ surgery later, I have them replaced and can adjust the vertical section too. I eventually need to replace those trimmers with more fitting ones, if I can find some. The other calibration problem was that the horizontal calibration signal wouldn't show up at all. I thought it might be that the calibration unit was broken, but since the vertical ones did show up, I dug deeper. Thankfully the schematic of the calibration unit are available. Both signals are sent to the 576 from the same source, just with different pins. Turns out that they arrive at the input pins alright. Oh, remember those two relays on the display switching board? Turns out that the one for the horizontal signal was not working. When the calibration unit wanted to feed a signal, it would just go into random noise near zero mode. I pulled out the relay, opened up the case and found the actuator to be stuck and seized with some rust took quite a bit of careful work to free it up again. Woohoo! It moves! Closing it up again with some heat staking to keep the cover on. And for the final steps, we are looking at the looping compensation settings. The goal would be to have a straight line but at 1 microamps per division vertically, that is almost impossible. So getting as close to it as possible should be good enough. As it could almost be predicted, one more bulb in the readout board died early in the tests. I finally got around replacing it, only to find yet another broken one. Honestly, it would be better to replace the lot, 
but this is quite fiddly work, so I stick with as needed for now. During the tests I am supposed to close the protective cover to check the safety interlock. Um, I don't have that, but I have an improvised alternative. There, works. The power indicator is supposed to be a green bulb, but mine came with a red one, which was also burned out. Like the yellow one for the collector supply disabled indicator. Now I've found good bulbs to replace the inner workings, but I really wanted the proper colors. And now I found a lot of different bulbs on eBay, so I have to wait for that package. Similarly, the polarity knob was a random replacement knob. I really would like to have the original grey colored one, but these knobs are rare. For now, I just put on another knob so I can switch that thing. I made a new cover for the CRT neck connector, opens CAD and 3D printing again. The test fixture was missing a screw to hold down the test bed. I found matching threads and sizes, but only with hex drive. Oh well, good enough. At least it's three and all the same style again.
the bottom cover had a few scratches in it. I cleaned them up with a file and mounted the rubber feet again. The screws for it, where there were quite a few of them missing, also got some new replacements. And finally, the covers, also with a new coat of paint. buttons. Well, the printing on them is a bit worn off in places and the color of most of them is anything but even. Since they slide in the frame, I don't want to paint them. A bit of sanding and magic eraser will have to do. For the writing, I'd love to put an engraving on there. It was a bit of nerve wracking. That cheap CNC mill is mental. The G-code has to be in a very specific format, like no trailing zeros in the numbers for example, amongst other things. But it worked. After sending off the discoloration, I put the button into an improvised clamp, engraved the text, filled the text with a marker pen and sent it off the axis again. And last but not least, I got some replacement bulbs for the two missing ones. A green one for the power and a working yellow one for the collector supply disabled indicator. The only thing that is still missing is the polarity switch. Let's see if I can cobble together something. The missing switch seems to be not only the same design as the mode switch right next to it, but also the same as on the test fixture. I decided to give my idea of casting a replacement a try again. While I can't easily make the embedded metal ring work in the cast for alignment issues, the cast version should be at least able to handle the test fixture knob. That way I can have the two originals next to each other and the remade one isn't as obvious. Hopefully. The knob replacement was not finished for this video, but there will be a follow up about it. And now a few tests. Let's look at a simple 1N4007 diode first.
and here we have a Zener diode. As you can see, the Zener effect has a rather large knee, which means that the diode will conduct quite a bit when it's close to the nominal voltage already. Which is why the datasheet will list the nominal voltage at a specific current, and if you really want to regulate voltages with one, you need to provide a regulated current into it, so that the voltage output is as precise as possible. And finally, a small transistor, BC337 in this case, as I have a bunch of them in my stash. So, what's missing? Mostly two things, the plug-in adapters and the protective box. I am looking to make my own of these, as some of the adapters are also fetching crazy high prices. Got an idea on how already, and collecting parts to do so. The adapters are important for low signal measurements, adding leads to connect the transistor is causing major looping issues already. I'll put up a separate video on those efforts. And so, this concludes the restoration of the Tektronix 576 Curve Tracer. I hope you enjoyed the project. See you next time! Good evening and welcome to Tinkering with Edkelar. For the fast two... Fast two... I can't even get past the first sentence. For the last two episodes, I've been taken apart. I have been taken apart. Falling to pieces here.